and very excited to be uh, here today for a virtual defense by Lindsay Cooper. Um, and it's, uh, it's going to be a great day. I just want to thank all of you for joining us, first of all. And I do want to thank our IT staff in the background, Rhett, Alora, and Emily. They are going to make sure that everything uh, goes extremely well as they always do with these presentations. And we really appreciate all the help that they've given Lindsay and all the other students who have to defend during these relatively difficult times. So thanks IT staff. I also wanna remind everyone of the rules of the road. All of you guys will be muted during uh, Lindsay's defense. Um, please don't attempt to turn on your video or your screen during the talk. Um, there will be an opportunity at the very end of her presentation. I'll actually be monitoring the questions. So when she's all done, we will open it up for questions. Um, and you can use the Zoom raise hand feature to notify me that you'd like to ask a question. And then we will unmute you um, to allow you to ask the question directly for Lindsay at the end. And at the very end of this, we will be having um, a committee meeting with Lindsay and myself and her other two committee members, um, Jason Smith and Kenneth Cole. And, uh, and then we will go from there. Um, there will also, just so you guys know, be a Zoom happy hour at the uh, six o'clock. It's being organized independently. And so there's a link for that as well. So given all that, I am just absolutely ecstatic to be here presenting to you, uh, Lindsay Cooper. Um, she came to us in 2013 from Cal State Northridge from a, a crew of colleagues and friends of ours um, that had extremely high recommendations for her. Larry Allen, Pete Edmonds, Mark Steele, Bob Carpenter, they all just loved Lindsay and thought she would be a great Moss Landing student. And so when I look back at her, her resume, she attached to her application, she has tons of experience in hospitality and customer service in addition to her science, which I think makes a lot of sense for those of you who've gotten to know her here at MLML. Lindsay loves people, she loves science, and she especially loves to talk to people about science. And I think that's one of her, her just awesome traits and, and a, great, a great skill that, that you get here at Moss Landing. She did give a uh, pre poster presentation at the Western Society of Naturalists and then has volunteered numerous times um, at MLML for outreach events, uh, including puppet shows and open house and, and did various other customer service jobs um, here and helping us with, with faculty recruitment dinner. She was amazing in the library. She was very successful there and I know she was very appreciated. Um, and she was my TA in stats class and we had, or sorry, seaweeds class and we had an absolute ball. It was, uh, it was a great time um, doing that course with her. She's won numerous awards. She's, she's been here at Moss Landing. She's won a couple of WAVE awards, uh, the Myers Trust Award, the Bill Watkins Memorial Scholarship, the Guild, um, the Quilt Guild Scholarship, and the Simpkins Family Award. So I think she's done a good job in promoting her own the, uh, research and, and getting funding for that. She really did take advantage of everything that Moss Landing Marine Labs has to offer. And so I just kind of wanted to read verbatim the last paragraph of her letter of intent to me um, when she applied um, last decade. Uh, and during my time as a graduate student at Moss Landing Marine Labs, I will make every effort to prove myself as a successful addition to a research team through my patience, my vitality, and my eagerness to learn. I will effectively contribute my leadership and communication skills to the program, along with my perpetual sense of curiosity. Having questions and thinking differently about ideas will allow me to open my mind to the infinite possibilities of research. My vision for the future is to emerge from my master's program as an ardent and effective science scientist. And I can just say, and I think all of you who are listening can say that Lindsay was absolutely successful in accomplishing her main goals. And it is just a wonderful, day today to be able to uh, give Lindsay the opportunity to present her thesis to you, which is entitled Compartmentalization and Seasonal Variability in Storage Compounds of Terragophora California, Californica. Take it away, Lindsay. <laughs> okay, thanks for making me emotional right off the bat, Mike. <laughs> That was so nice. Thank you. I was terrified when you were about to read my <laughs> letter of intent. I did not remember what I wrote, but hey, it was pretty good. Oh, God. Okay. Thank you for that, Mike. What a lovely introduction. And I just want to say thanks to everyone that is tuning in today for my talk. I wish I could see you all in person. Whoa. 
Okay. I'm gonna start my talk by giving you a little preview to show you what you guys are in for. Oh, let me get my laser pointer. Okay. So I'm gonna start my introduction with some important background info relating to my study and how I formulated my questions. Then I'll move into the methods which details my experiment and how I collected data. <clears throat> My results and discussion section is divided into three parts. I'll go through the results for one question and then I'll discuss them before moving on to the next. And finally, I'll wrap up the talk with overall conclusions of the study. I also wanna direct your attention to the text in the upper left corner of this slide. <clears throat> Each slide will have a section label located here in case you need a reference. So now let's just jump right in before I change my mind. When people think of kelp forest ecosystems, this is potentially what they envision. Giant kelp canopy at the surface teeming with life. However, if you go out and take a look for yourself, this is more of like what you would actually see down there. That biodiversity you saw in the previous illustration is for the most part not up at the surface canopy or in the water column. It's down near the benthos, inhabiting an area we call the understory. The understory is a whole other kelp forest canopy below the giant kelp that's also highly important. Um, other species of subtital seaweeds making up the understory guild provide food and shelter for a diverse benthic community. These other seaweeds include brown algae, coralline algae, lady reds, and other species of kelps. As you can see in these two photos, there are some conspicuously taller, more rigid seaweeds forming that secondary canopy. There's one in particular in the foreground here on the left, and then a bunch more of that same one in the photo on the right. <clears throat> this species of kelp is called Pteragophora californica. As I learned about Pteragophora in class lectures and familiarized myself with it while scuba diving, it became increasingly more interesting to me. It has so many unique qualities that allow it to inhabit the same space as Macrocystis pyrifera, the giant kelp, which is the competitive dominant species of our local kelp forest. Um, throughout my talk, I'll also refer to this species as just Pterogophora and also as Terry for short. Pteragophora grows subtitally along the coast from Alaska to Baja. It's part of the understory guild creating that secondary canopy. And in this photo on the right, I'm holding an individual. You can see it's fairly tall. I'm 5'8 and it's about my height. This is an adult sized pteragophora. Juvenile pteragophora are shorter and thinner, but the adults can get even taller and thicker than the one that I'm holding here. So you can imagine that a whole population of these would create their own little forest above the seafloor with lots of life underneath. Not only does Pteragophora create a habitat, but also a source of food for a number of organisms. It's slow growing and long lived and individuals have been observed growing for approximately 16 years. Like trees, it forms annual growth rings. Two rings, a light and dark, are formed each year, coinciding with seasonal light availability. This photo on the right is one of my own pteragophora samples. And as you can see, the rings are not all that crisp and easy to identify. Um, this is very characteristic of pteragophora in our region as opposed to others in British Columbia, for example, which have more evident growth rings due to photo period. The occurrence of these rings is not only, not only allows for aging the individual, but it also depicts seasonal patterns of growth. Pteragophora has both perennial and annual parts, meaning that some of the structures persist year after year and others form new structures each year. The body of a kelp is called a thallus, so I'm gonna walk you through the morphology of a Pteragophora thallus. Pteragophora californica is the only species in the genus Pteragophora 
and it has unique morphology that no other kelp has. Starting at the base, there's a structure called the holdfast that anchors the thallus to the rocks. It resembles the roots of a plant, however, it does not function to absorb nutrients from the rocks. Its main function is attachment. Growing vertically from the holdfast is a rigid structure resembling a stem called the stipe. The holdfast and stipe are perennial structures that unless dislodged or eaten will exist year after year. Growing laterally from the top of the stipe are reproductive blades called sporophylls. The small lobe-like blades at the top are new growth, and the larger blades at the bottom are more mature. The sporophylls grow and die in conveyor belt-like fashion, where mature blades will fall off and new ones grow in the top to replace them. So a pterogophora will have sporophylls all year round, but perhaps not the same sporophylls. When pterogophora becomes annually reproductive, it grows thicker, darker patches of tissue on the sporophylls called sori, and this region produces the spores. Here's an actual photo of a saurus on one of my pterogophora samples. You can see that it's thicker, you can't see the light through the blade as much, and it actually um, feels slightly different too. So last but not least, growing apically from the stipe is the vegetative blade. This blade does not produce spores. And before I move on, I also want to mention that the main graphic that I use of pterogophora was taken from an old dichotomous key. There are so few good photos and drawings of Terry out there, which really is a reflection on how little research has been done on this species compared to others like Macrocystis. Um, so many of the photos and drawings you'll see throughout the rest of my talk were contributed by local artists and talented moss landing students. Like other kelps, Pterogophora exhibits seasonal patterns due in part by seasonal variability of factors in the surrounding environment, such as temperature, light irradiance, and nutrient availability. It shows seasonal growth patterns in stipe elongation and thickening, like I showed you with the annual growth rings, has various patterns of blade growth, and seasonally produces fertile sori on the sporophylls for reproduction. A characteristic of pterogophora that really got my wheels turning in the beginning was the fact that the maximum blade growth takes place during the winter. So underwater irradiance decreases during winter and therefore so does photosynthesis. So how does pterogophora grow the most during a time of low photosynthesis? Another fun fact for you to think about is that pterogophora can have all of its blades ripped or chewed off which is the majority of its photosynthetic biomass and looking like just a sad stick attached to a rock. And it can still regrow blade tissue and produce spores. So this is really interesting because unlike plants, pterogophora does not have that root system to draw in essential nutrients to produce the regrowth. So I thought this was pretty cool and that it must be relying on internal resources for this to happen. But what resources does pterogophora need? We know that carbon and nitrogen are the building, building blocks of life. As an autotroph, pterogophora needs to be able to capture and utilize carbon and nitrogen in different capacities. Nitrogen is absorbed and used to build proteins and enzymes important for various functions, including tissue growth and production of photosynthetic pigments. Carbon is fixed during photosynthesis and used to form complex sugars. These sugars can be transported to other regions and utilized for blade growth and reproduction. Pterogophora is able to transport compounds like sugars because of specialized physiology. Since pterogophora is a type of kelp, it has unique physiological features compared to other species of seaweeds. To the right is a basic depiction of the cross section of a kelp stipe. The center oval shape is called the medulla, which all seaweeds possess, but the medulla of kelps have specialized structures called trumpet hyphae. 
Trumpet hyphae are longitudinal filaments of cells seen in the microscopy photo at the top here. And they're joined in the middle by cr uh, porous cross walls called sieve plates, which you can see here in this stained microscopy photo. These structures facilitate transport of compounds throughout the thallus, and this transport is called translocation. It's analogous to the xylem and phloem system in vascular plants. It has been shown that deciduous trees are able to regrow leaves because of nutrient reserves accumulated within their trunks. Using the xylem and phloem, they reallocate nutrients to other regions, therefore budding new growth. So does pterogophora have a storage mechanism of its own? If pterogophora possesses the necessary physiology, has seasonal growth and reproduction, and can bounce back from devastating amounts of biomass loss, then why couldn't pterogophora be capable of storing nutrients and utilizing them when needed? Upon further research, I found that very little work has been done on this subject, especially with regards to pterogophora. Studies have provided evidence of nutrient transport in pterogophora, but no one has def uh, definitively demonstrated storage reserves in particular locations. So this organically led me to develop these research questions. Right off the bat, I wanted to answer, does pterogophora exhibit within thallus compartmentalization of nutrients? In theory, if nutrients were accumulated in a storage area, then they would appear in different amounts in one or more regions of the thallus. So this is what I'm defining as compartmentalization. Second question, does pterogophora exhibit seasonal variability in the compartmentalization of nutrients? I was interested to see if compartmentalization did exist, would it have a significant seasonal pattern? I addressed this question by testing pterogophora over time. And finally, does biomass loss impact the nutrients within storage compartments in pterogophora? Doing a biomass removal experiment could potentially affect the compartmentalization and illustrate the reallocation of nutrients. With all of these questions in mind, I developed an extensive underwater experiment. Okay, so while I take a sip of water, here's a picture of my last Terry Hall on my last collection day ever for my project. There are, I think about 97 ter whole pterogophora thalli in this tarp. And I'm wearing my custom pterogophora hat that I always would wear on field days. Okay. Due to the following reasons, I chose to run my experiment at a site called Stillwater Cove in Pebble Beach. This site is well described by many moss landing re researchers over the years. It opens to the southwest, so it's fairly protected from large swells coming in from the north. There's also year round access to this site and moss landing students regularly dive here. And finally, Stillwater Cove consistently has large healthy populations of pterogophora. <clears throat> On SCUBA, I set up a subtitle experiment that would run for 15 months. I laid a lead line through a dense population of pterogophora at about nine meters depth, and I marked each end with a surface buoy. Um, I do wanna mention that there's also giant kelp canopy and understory seaweeds at this site, but I'm just focusing on pterogophora for the purpose of this graphic. So you can imagine that monitoring organisms underwater for over a year could get very disorienting, especially as the surrounding environment starts to change. So to try to make it a little easier on myself, I attached numbered PVC placards to the lead line at 10 meter increments to visually break up, break up the lead line into sections. 
Here's an underwater photo of the lead line. It's running right here. It's not easy to see. Um, and here's one of my numbered placards that is attached to it. In reality, it's much more difficult to see down there, especially when there's poor visibility. So these adding these markers to the lead line really helped it stand out much better. The sections also served a few other purposes. The first being to orient myself along the lead line when my directionality inevitably got turned around. I was also able to designate sections to different divers for sampling purposes. So all sections were properly maintained and recorded. And finally, if any other dive pairs needed to locate my buddy and me, they would know exactly what section we were in. Subtitle research cannot be accomplished alone. And in this case, I needed lots of help to set up and sample my experiment. A team of friends and I randomly tagged over 200 Terragophora thalli within a few meters on either side of the lead line. But not all, Terragoph not all 200 Terragophora were analyzed due to dislodgement, uh, losing their tags from pesky animal chewing, and the high cost of chemical analysis. But I wanted to start myself out with a large population to really play it safe. Each color-coded tag was made of an embossing label threaded onto a color-coordinated zip tie. Tag color was associated with an experimental treatment which was typed onto the tag as well. Once each Terragophora had a tag secured to the base of the stipe, uh, divers cut the blades on each thallus according to their assigned treatments. These blade cuts were maintained once a month for the 15-month experiment. Blades were manipulated in the following ways. Controls, which were completely unmanipulated, were adorned with hot pink. Thalli, who had all of the sporophylls cut off, were in orange. Thalli with the entire vegeta vegetative blade cut off with, were in green. And finally, those with the vegetative blade and all sporophylls removed were in blue. Groups of three thalli from each treatment were harvested every month for the entire experiment. By harvesting, I mean that I very gently pried the holdfast from the rock it was attached to, and then I took the whole thallus with me back to the lab. Only controls were harvested at the start of the experiment because the others had just been manipulated on that same date. And so by collecting the controls at this time, I was able to get baseline data for the Terragophora at the start of the experiment. Each thallus needed to be prepped before tissue samples could be taken. Um, but luckily I had several lovely undergrad interns who helped me out in the lab with every aspect of my sample processing. In the top right here is a hold fast that's completely covered in epibionts consisting of other algae and invertebrates. Um, there, were, there was also um, growth along the stipe and on all, most of the other blades. Um, so, uh, oops, okay. So we removed as much of this uh, growth as possible without damaging the Terragophora um, for two reasons, so that it wouldn't affect the weights of the thallus parts and also so that they wouldn't contribute their own carbon and nitrogen content to my sample measurements. The picture at the bottom here is a hold fast after we had cleaned all, um, as much of the growth off as possible. I took 15 morphometric measurements of each thallus region or, or, or of each thallus um, to get a good grasp of the sizes, biomasses, fertility, et cetera, of the population throughout the study. Although these parameters did not directly answer my questions, I was able to use information about the population when reviewing my results. So these are the same thallus regions I showed you before, but for my sampling purposes, I divided the stipe into three regions, creating a total of seven areas of interest for chemical analysis. Because translocation through the stipe covers such a long distance, I thought that dividing them 
into multiple part, dividing the stipe into multiple parts would cover as much length of the stipe as possible in case there were difference, differences in nutrient concentrations along the stipe. So for example, maybe the if the sugars were traveling through the stipe, they wouldn't, they would stop at the middle instead of going all the way down. So I, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't take upper stipe samples from this region here labeled transition zone um, because it's such, it has such morphological overlap um, with the, the sporophylls and the vegetative blade growing from the top of the stipe that I wasn't sure if it would um, back to my, my stipe sample. So what I did was take the upper stipe sample from just below that region. I cut, a th I cut three to five gram wet weight samples from each region. But um, since some structures were not always present like the sorus because of reproduction, um, or I had removed them in blade manipulations, there wasn't always enough tissue for each region for the analysis. So some of my thalli, I would end up with seven samples for, and then others I might end up with only five or six. To prepare the cut tissue for chemical analysis, each piece was first dried at 60 degrees C in an oven for a few days. And I learned that apparently when you dry pterygophora stipe, it magically turns to rebar because it was so incredibly hard that I couldn't get the ball mill to grind it at all. Um, so what I ended up having to do was I first had to crush them with a mallet and a very heavy uh, two-piece steel device that was fabricated for me by Chris Machado in the MLML shop. Huge, huge thanks to Chris for helping me with this because I was really struggling to get those stipes ground up. But after I was able to break those up a bit, I could grind all dried samples into a fine powder using a ball mill. Those powdered tissues were measured out into one to three milligram samples on a microbalance, and each sample was folded tightly into a tin capsule. These capsules were sent to the stable isotope lab at UC Santa Cruz for analysis. The lab at UCSC uses instruments such as an elemental analyzer and an isotope mass ratio mass spectrometer to get different values of carbon and nitrogen from organic tissue. So data for each sample included values for percent C, or sorry, percent carbon and percent nitrogen by dry weight, carbon to nitrogen ratio, and delta C13, which is a measurement ob obtained from stable isotope analysis that's used as a tool to try to observe carbon allocation from one area to another. So um, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of Delta C13 before I get into the results so that you're better able to follow along with me. Delta C13 is an isotopic signature, a measure of the ratio of stable isotopes C13 and C12 reported in parts per thousand relative to a standard. During photosynthesis, the carbon that becomes fixed in plant tissue is significantly depleted in C13 relative to the atmosphere. Isotopic carbon data has been used frequently in vascular plant research, where they found that carbon allocation can drive isotopic gradients in different types of tissue. It has been observed that heterotrophic tissues such as roots and stems are generally C13 enriched relative to autotrophic tissue such as the leaves. Regions receiving nutrients are often called sinks and regions providing nutrients are sources. Okay. So this is a photo of my, some samples at my desk. And in this moment, they are also encroaching on Elizabeth's desk. <laughs> okay, let's dive into the results. The following results are for data analyzed for the presence of compartmentalization of resources. These will address the question, 
does Terragophora exhibit within thallus compartmentalization of resources? Or, uh, yeah, nutrients resources, same. All samples in these analyses are from unmanipulated control thalli and are only also, or I'm sorry, and are also from all sampling dates lumped together. So to first orient you to my results, data in this talk will be represented by mean values compared statistically by analysis of variance with an alpha of 0 0.05, meaning that any p-values less than or equal to 0 0.05 were significant. Significant results were compared with a Tukey post hoc test. Error bars are in standard error, and data not connected by the same letter are significantly different. So the first graph is mean percent C among thallus regions. I have thallus region along the x-axis and percent C on the y-axis. All graphs in this section will have thallus region on the bottom and nutrient value on the left. So the holdfast, sporophyll, and vegetative blade regions had significantly lower carbon highlighted in red than all of the stipe regions and the sorus highlighted in green. And I'm going to uh, continue using the green and red high and low mo motif for um, in the rest of the results. So the delta C13 data are on a negative scale. So if you remember, I told you that when um, carbon is fixed in plant tissue, sorry, when it's fixed during photosynthesis, the plant tissue becomes less C13 enriched than the atmosphere. So that's why we have this negative scale. And then the higher negative numbers mean that that tissue sample is less enriched in C13. So here we can see that the sporophyll and the vegetative blade regions were more C13 enriched than the lower stipe region. Here we have percent N among thallus regions. And the holdfast had significantly higher percent N than every other thallus region. This is quite a pattern. I really like this, <laughs> this pattern. Um, in addition, the lower stipe had significantly higher percent N than the upper stipe and all the blade regions. So the upper stipe is more similar to the top portion of the pteragophora and the lower stipe is more similar to the mid stipe. For carbon to nitrogen ratio, the holdfast was significantly lower than all other regions, which corresponds with the carbon and nitrogen data where the holdfast was highest in nitrogen and low in carbon. There's a clear gradient, an increasing gradient from the bottom to the top of the stipe and once you get to the blades, you can see that the sporophyll is more similar to the mid and lower stipe than it is to the other blade regions. So I'm gonna discuss all these results before I go on to the second section. To reiterate, the question I addressed in this section was, does pteragophora exhibit within thallus compartmentalization of nutrients? And the answer to this question is, heck yes, it does. There were significantly different nutrient content among thallus regions. So let's just dive back into what I saw a little bit, a uh, little bit more detail. So for percent C, both types of, uh, uh, sorry, both types of vegetative blade and sporophylls blade tissue, and the holdfast had lower carbon than all the stipe regions and the sorus. So I found it a little unusual that the holdfast was significantly different than the stipe since they're both perennial and they're in close proximity. It did seem pretty logical that the sorus was high in carbon um, because many organisms put huge amounts of energy into reproduction. However, previous kelp research suggests that the energy cost of producing spores may be quite low. So it's likely that the allocation of carbon 
to form spores is small, but great enough to show a significant difference relative to the, the uh, regular blade tissues. And the last thing that surprised me was that the sporophylls had the least carbon percentage of the entire thallus. Um, although the blades perform the bulk of photosynthesis, this pattern suggests that sporophylls may be continuously transporting those photosynthates down to create reserves elsewhere. Delta C13. So earlier I described that vascular plant research has discovered that carbon allocation can drive isotopic gradients in different types of tissue. And that there's a general pattern of C13 enriched sink tissue relative to source tissue. Well, in 2013, Mike Fox, who is also a graduate of the MLML Phycology Lab, did isotopic research on macrocystis. And he illustrated that similar to plants, giant kelp frond initials acting as dominant sinks were consistently C13 enriched compared to canopy blades acting as sources. So macrocystis was observed translocating C13 enriched compounds from mature canopy blades to frond initials, aiding in recovery. At first glance, my results appear to reveal that in general, the lower stipe is acting as a source region, transporting carbon to the blades acting as sinks. But this concept is very tricky. I could assume that this signal is from the lower stipe translocating to the blades while they grow. However, when the blades get to a certain size and could presumably sustain their own growth, they would produce a surplus and translocate nutrients back down the other direction. But with this data, I can only see signal in the upwards direction. Another big factor is that carbon fractionation also takes place during photosynthesis and respiration. So it's very likely that these processes are affecting the isotopic values in these regions as well. Um, but because of the perennial nature, I do believe that the lower stipe is accumulating a carbon reserve, but I think there's a lot more complexity going on with the allocation in the thallus than I was able to detect with my results. Okay, percent nitrogen results are probably the most unexpected findings of my study. Since photosynthetic pigments contain lots of nitrogen, Naturally, I expected to see higher nitrogen values in the blades, but the holdfast had significantly more nitrogen than every other thallus region. There's a clear pattern of decreasing nitrogen from the base up to the blades. In addition, the lower stipe was similar to the mid stipe, but different or uh, higher in nitrogen than the upper stipe and all of the blade regions. There's a dark epidermal layer of tissue that covers the stipe and the holdfast. So it's possible that this contains lots of pigment and consequently lots of pigment proteins. But if this were the reason for the high nitrogen values, then the holdfast and all the stipe regions would be similar to each other, but they were not. So it's more likely that these perennial regions are serving as sites for nitrogen storage, allowing for nutrient allocation. Um, pigment and protein analyses would really help to um, break down what forms of nitrogen is being accumulated in these regions. So carbon to nitrogen is a nutritional balancing ratio, and in this case it shows the relationship of the amount of carbon to nitrogen in each region of the pteragophora thallus. The most obvious result was the holdfast having the lowest C to N ratio of all the thallus regions, which is consistent with its high nitrogen values and low carbon values. The holdfast was the only region whose results did not overlap with any of the other thallus regions. We can also see this increasing gradient up the stipe and the sporophylls being more uh, similar to the lower and mid stipe regions than to the other blades. So historically, 
CN ratios have been used to distinguish between terrestrial and marine organisms and also used in conjunction with growth rates to determine which nutrients could be limiting factors for growth. Uh, my results in this case might yield more information in conjunction with tissue growth data, but as far as I know, carbon to nitrogen ratios have not been analyzed across all regions of the same thallus for comparison. Okay. This is another underwater photo at my site. And these are probably most likely control individuals that have not been cut at all. And you can actually see some sori on these blades. All right, let's get back to it. To characterize seasonal fluctuations of nutrient compartmentalization, I harvested pterygophora for 15 months. This section will address the question, does pterygophora exhibit seasonal variability in compartmentalization of nutrients? Like the first section, these results are only for unmanipulated control thalli. The sorus region was excluded from statistical analysis because sori were not present for all sampling dates due to the seasonal reproductive cycle. So to address the first question, I only tested one factor against the nutrient data, which was thallus region. But for the second question, I added another factor and tested sampling date along with thallus region. So to spare you guys from looking at about a dozen graphs, I'm just gonna show you a simple table of my results for this section. Using, oh, sorry. Using a two-way analysis of variance, I tested nutrient data for the effects of sampling date, thallus region, and the interaction of sampling date and thallus region to see if there were com combined effects of these factors on the nutrient values. This interaction term should tell me if there is a seasonal effect on the compartmentalization I discovered in the previous section. Delta C13 and percent N showed significant, uh, significant effects of season regardless of thallus region. This tells me that there was some seasonal variability of delta C13 and percent N, but for the entire thallus. I saw the same significant variability of nutrients among thallus compartments like in the previous section. And finally, the interaction term showed no significant effects of seasonality with thallus region. So if the compartments were changing, it was changing proportionally. So to sum up the results for the question, does pterygophora exhibit seasonal variability in compartmentalization of nutrients? The answer is no, it doesn't. There were no significantly different nutrient compartments over time. The only seasonal variability of nutrients I saw was for the entire thallus. So here's a really cool picture that I love from my site where this is a thallus from the blue treatment where I cut off the vegetative blade and all the sporophylls. And in this picture, you can see a couple little sporophylls um, regrowing from the top here, which is the cool, indication of nutrient allocation to blade growth. Okay, so I manipulated experimental thalli to see if tissue loss would affect the nutrient values within storage compartments. This section addresses the question, does biomass loss impact the nutrients within storage compartments in pterygophora? So the previous two sections described results for unmanipulated controls only. And in this final section, I'll discuss results from comparing the controls to thalli manipulated under the other three treatments. Also, unlike the previous sections, data from the first collection date was excluded as it was the start of the manipulations and only controls were harvested. Since I confirmed the existence of compartments with the controls in the first section. My factors for this analysis were sampling date and treatment within each thallus region. Although I found no seasonal effects on compartments in the second section, 
I added sampling date to this model to test the interacting effects. I did a two-way analysis of variance for each thallus region individually, testing nutrients for effects of sampling date, treatment, and their interacting effect. So the only significant results were for percent C by treatment in the three stipe regions. And so I'll be showing you the graphs of these results. Okay, the first graph shows the significant differences in percent C um, by treatment in the lower stipe region, regardless of season. The lower stipe samples from phthalate in the minus vegetative blade treatment had higher percent C than those in the minus sporophylls and minus sporophylls and vegetative blades. Significant treatment effects were also seen in the mid stipe, but this time phthalae from the minus vegetative blade treatment and the controls were higher in percent C than minus sporophylls and the minus ve uh, vegetative and sporophylls. And finally, there is a significant treatment effect on percent C in the upper stipe region as well. And like the mid stipe, both the, the minus vegetative blade and control treatments had higher percent C than the minus sporophylls and minus both. So let's quickly summarize. Does biomass loss impact the nutrients within thallus compartments in pterygophora? Yes, it does. There are significant treatment effects in compartments regardless of season. And there was no interaction of season and treatment on nutrient compartments. In the lower stipe, the minus vegetative blade phthalate had more carbon than the minus sporophylls and minus both. This clearly illustrates that removing the sporophylls has a greater impact on the carbon in the lower stipe than removing the vegetative blade. The mid and upper stipe had the same results where the control and the minus vegetative blade samples had higher carbon than the uh, minus sporophylls and minus both. So this is consistent with the lower stipe region where it appears that removing the vegetative blade has little to no effect on the carbon content in the mid and upper stipe. The loss of sporophylls seems to drive the carbon changes. And based on photos and morphometric measurements of my thalli, the biomass loss appears to suggest allocation of nutrients from perennial regions to aid in recovery. So here are your main takeaways from my study. Question one. Pterygophora does compartmentalize. Um, this is really exciting for me because this was like the whole concept that got me interested in pterygophora and it's what I, um, what I basically built my other questions off of. So no matter the season, all the stipe regions had, were high in carbon and so was the saurus when the saurus was present. The vegetative blade and sporophylls were C13 enriched relative to the lower stipe. And the holdfast had more nitrogen than any other region. And for some reason, I really geek out over this result. I, it's probably because I just wasn't expecting it at all and it came out of left field. Question two, there was a no seasonal effect on compartmentalization, which is really interesting because I went into this proposing that question thinking that I would see a seasonal effect on compartmentalization, but the only variability I saw was um, over the entire thallus. So if the compartments were fluctuating, it was proportional. And finally, question three, does bi biomass loss does affect nutrient compartments? No matter the season, cutting sporophylls decreases carbon in all of the stipe regions. 
I'm thoroughly excited because my study provides the first empirical evidence of compartmentalization of nutrients in Terragophora californica, an underrated and frequently overlooked species of our co coastal kelp forest. Um, if I could do more work on Terragophora, this is how I would approach it. I'd like to include the transition zone as a region of interest. So when I developed my methods, I originally thought that the stipe was gonna be really important and that I, I just wanted to make sure to cover as much length of the stipe with um, nutrient measurements as I could. And I, I was thinking of the transition zone as this weird region of morphological overlap and meristematic growth that just would be really hard to tease apart, but knowing what I know now and seeing the patterns that I saw, I think it wouldn't be too complicated. I think it'd be really interesting to see how the nutrients fluctuate in this region because it it's such it's an area from which so much from which so much growth uh, originates. The holdfast is clearly not just for attachment. There are some really interesting things going on in this region. And I would definitely study the holdfast in more detail. It's my new favorite part of Terragophora. <laughs> I love to run many more samples than I was ultimately able to afford. I had these grand plans of uh, how many samples I was going to analyze, uh, but um, I ended up really having to cut back. If I had lots of grant money, ideally, I'd love to run so many different analyses, such as uh, protein and chlorophyll to supplement my bulk nitrogen data and tease apart what's going on, in, uh, like what forms of nitrogen are being stored. I would do uh, phosphorus analysis so I could supplement my carbon and nitrogen ratio data, and then I could compare my values to the red field ratio. Um, I would do sugar analysis and a C14 tracer experiment so I could tease apart the carbon data and um, supplement the isotopic carbon signatures that I found. I still have all of my powdered samples, hundreds of which have not been analyzed at all, and I still have all of my extra pterygophora tissue, including the holdfasts and transition zones. So if anyone who's listening today is interested in studying Terragophora, please come talk to me. There, there are so many more questions to be answered. This was just the start. Thank you so much to my committee members. <laughs> my advisor, Mike, accepted me into his lab having very little experience, and he encouraged me to grow as a scientist. He can literally get anyone so excited about seaweeds and his seaweeds class and his scientific methods class are just incredible. Uh, Kenneth Cole was the resident chemical oceanographer and I was fortunate enough to be one of his last mentees since he re he's recently retired. I really hope he stays involved because he has so much life wisdom and he is like the most calming and supportive person. I could go to him for reassurance anytime and he always managed to make me feel better. He also taught the marine instrumentation class which this photo was taken from through my uh, welding helmet. And it was, that class was so fun and it really made you feel like you could build any type of equipment you needed for your project. And last but certainly not least, is Jason Smith who runs the environmental biotech lab. Jason helped me work through my sample analyses when I was developing them and, and um, figuring out what I could and couldn't do. And he helped me understand some of the more complicated aspects of my results, which was so incredibly helpful. And Jason is always so happy and positive. My committee members are like serious science rock stars. I also want to give an, like an extra special thanks to Mike, for, sorry, oh God, for bringing me into the psychology lab where he fosters such a tight knit family environment. When you join the Fike lab, he tells you that his students will in, infiltrate every aspect of your life, which is, he's so right. 
He teaches us to critically analyze each other's work and to help one another to make sure our projects always get done. So thank you for all of that, Mike. Damn it. Okay. How do I even be able to thank Steve for everything that he's done for me? Steve's first week in the lab, I told him that we were gonna be best friends and he had no idea how right I actually was. <laughs> he was my most trusted dive buddy, coworker. He has motivated me through the toughest moments of my thesis and my project would absolutely not be what it is today without him. Mo and I were the only two students to join the Fike Lab our, our semester. And before school started, I called her to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm such a sorority girl, I swear. Um, we had an instant bond and always had such a great time together. She's just such a bright, positive, caring soul that just lights up every room she walks into. She made me this, she made this sign for us, <laughs> like, during the first week of, of the semester and she posted it up like we had desks right next to each other and she posted it up we called it like our double wide desk um she's always been there to support me along the way i did not get i did not get stefan's humor when he first joined the lab and i was like who the heck is this guy but a switch flipped in my head and ever since he's just been one of my best friends best most loyal most hysterical friends if you're dreading doing any activity just invite stefan to go with you and he will manage to make it fun um going into the field to help with his project was like my favorite research help i ever did at moss because i just love being around stefan thank you for always supporting me I was the TA for Cody, Steve, and Stefan in their seaweeds class, and we got really close. We did lots of diving together, and we had many late nights helping each other process samples at the lab. The photo in the upper left is like one of my favorite pictures. It's from one of those late nights together at the lab, and thank you for always being at my side codes. If fairy godmothers existed, Sarah Jeffries would be mine because <laughs> she was my tried and true diving all-star. Whenever I needed her, she also talked me down off of a ledge many times, and she has long been the backbone of the phycology lab. Melinda, do, don't think I forgot about you. Melinda saved my samples multiple times, one in particular when the freezer that I had like everything I owned in um just went kaput and melinda helped me move get them all moved into found me another freezer and got them all moved in with me melinda you're just the best um amber has spent so much time just sitting in a room working beside me we've spent so many late nights and weekends in the library we motivated each other every day and we were just determined to drag each other across the finish line She's my special little mermaid. And I could never forget those two little fuzzle butts who unknowingly supported me emotionally the last few years. The beer pigs, which are past and present um, phycology lab mates are like my second family that have supported me throughout this whole journey. And boy, do we know how to have a good time. <laughs> Go ahead. There you go. Thank you to all the other friends I made at Moss Landing. It really is such a special community and I've made so many memories and I have years and years worth of photographic evidence and blackmail material. So many people, so many other people have helped me make it to this day and to anyone I forgot to include, I'm so sorry. Just know that you are very appreciated and all the other students that helped me process my samples and die with me I never ever would have finished all that work on my own I'm so grateful to you thanks to marine ops facilities dive ops IT library staff MJ for support 
to my funding sources, my wonderful employers that kept a roof over my head. Kim Solano at the Haute and Gelada hired me when I first moved up to Monterey Bay and she's been like a, a mom away from home for all these years. Thanks to Joan for hiring me and for Kate, to Katie for keeping me on um, as library staff and being so supportive. It was really nice to work for you and thanks to Kim for letting me pick up extra hours down at your end of the hallway. And finally, I'd like to thank my family for everything they've done for me and for all their love. And this is some of the awesome Terragofera artwork that was shared with me for my talk. It was really a pleasure presenting my work to you guys. Thank you all for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, Lindsay, well done. Congratulations, sweetheart. We're gonna go ahead and ask some questions first and then um, I'm just gonna open up the mic when we're all done with the questions and let everyone give you a hoot, hoot, hoot. So I do have a couple of questions right off the bat, Lindsay. Yeah. One of them comes um, from Jim Harvey. So I wanted to read this to you myself, okay? It says, um, Lindsay, it seems that the greater surface area of the sporophylls relative to the vegetative blade might overwhelm the vegetative blade. What do you think the result would have been if you had another treatment where you left only one sporophyll and had the vegetative blade. So I think what he's asking is, if uh -huh. the sporophyll biomass kind of equaled the vegetative biomass, do you think you still would have seen the same effects? That's a really good question, Jim. <laughs> I mean, with the biomass removal experiment, yes, potentially since I removed so much biomass compared to the vegetative blade it's it's possible there definitely could have been different results um since like not thinking about the biomass experiment the samples were done the nutrient samples were done like according to the sa that sample weight so i think yeah, I do think for the bio biomass experiment that would have been really interesting to see that's a really good point um, and I also have, like, there, there are so many things I took measurements of. I could go back a million times over and look at all different aspects. So I would, I would love to look at so many more things, but that's a really good point, a really good question. All right, let me, let me follow up on that real quickly for myself. So do you think the sporophylls are special or do you think they just had the most biomass? I think... I think the biomass is a really big part of it. I think that, I mean, the only thing that really makes them special is that they produce the saurus, but like um, Fister and Devrede, like they, they had shown that um, real, like very little uh, energy goes into producing the spores. Um, so it probably is just like, mostly affected by the biomass. I don't think much is like significantly special about them. So then that does our, uh, beg the question. This is Central California, Stillwater Cove, Terragophora. But if you look at the papers by Dayton et al, they've got Terragophora down there that have humongous vegetative blades where it's really the growth of the vegetative blade that drives the biomass. So again, that would kind of be similar to Jim's question. So you, you might expect to see different results in Southern California then if you did this? I mean, I definitely think that, excuse me, and like seasonality in particular measurements would be different across their range because like the Terragophera that I had here, I didn't have any sampling dates where there was no vegetative blade, but in other regions, they senesce, they like cleave off the vegetative blade and it really is an annual structure, but I never saw that. Mine had vegetative blade all year round. So I, I definitely think if I tested what I had in different regions, there would, there would be some differences for sure. Okay, cool. And we do have some couple of questions. I want to get to a couple of other people. I'm going to ask Bobby San Miguel to <laughs> unmute so that he can ask you your question, his question. Hey, Bobby. Congratulations. You did a fantastic presentation. Um, and I have one question for you. 
So uh, I was really interested in that second question that you asked and we're looking mm -hmm. at um, regarding seasonality. And so I was really excited and hoping to see like you were expecting, I guess, uh, the interaction term being significant there. And it wasn't. So, you know, normally in plants, you'd see a source sink interaction with seasonality kind of thing. That's why we don't say that nutrients flow from the leaves to the roots because in the spring they go the opposite direction. So that's why we say source and sink. And so given that does not seem to be happening here in Terragophora, what do you think is driving that seasonal change throughout the entire thallus? Um, I'm, I'm not really, I don't know. Like it's, it's funny cause I originally was going to add in some seasonal results that I found when I, I had like dived in a little further and I looked at the, the seasonal variability like within each thallus region individually since I didn't see it over um, or like since I didn't see them among the thallus regions and I did see some variability within each compartment. So I could go back into my data and I could see which ones were potentially causing the fluctuation, but um, the fluctuations that I saw within each compartment were actually from different nutri uh, uh, nutrient variables than I had seen in the fluctuation over the whole thallus. So like there's just a lot of stuff going on there that I would have to really tease apart and probably supplement with extra diff like different chemical analyses. Does that help at all? <laughs> All right, great. We're going to move on to Emily Schmelzer, who's going to unmute herself and ask you her question. Yeah. Congratulations, Hi. Lindsay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> that was a really great presentation. It was really nice for, it's very clear for me who doesn't know anything about kelp. Sorry, Graham. I forgot stuff. Um, I know. <laughs> I actually had a question for you. Um, for your sampling design, I know obviously that they're not reproductive all year round, um, but did you do any sort of like paired statistical analysis for the blades that did have the sori with their compartmentalization based on whether or not they had the reproductive, reproductive blades? Because um, you said you sort of lumped them all in together for the stati statistical analysis, but yeah. obviously not all of them are gonna have those reproductive blades all the time. Yeah, I actually, just because there were so many different things going on in my data, I only, I, I kept getting errors if I tried to add in the saurus. So I threw that out of the analysis. And I actually, I did do some stats with a lot of my morphometrical stuff. So I did like, stats on like for uh, significance in like fertility with all the treatment, different treatments. And I did, I compared like the biomasses of the sporophylls to each other, but I didn't, I didn't compare the, com the thallus regions to like, are you asking if I compared like which ones had the reproductive, rep reproductive spori compared to the compartments? Yeah, I'm wondering if you looked at any of like the individual variability for any of your um, samples. Mm -hmm. I didn't look at thallus to thallus, like thallus by thallus. Okay. Do you think that you would have seen the same patterns if you had looked at individual variability based on whether or not they had the reproductive blades? Um. It's so it's it's maybe it's possible because I did see that significant car percentage of carbon difference by from the sporophylls to the saurus that they were significantly different in like bulk carbon. So it is possible that I could see some differences there. Um, but so it, like it's kind of a weird thing because kelps don't allocate that much energy just 
to reproduction. However, I saw that significant signal in mine. So it's just kind of like, yeah, it would be interesting to look at. Future research questions. Okay, I have yeah. one more question and you might have already said this, but my <laughs> was being weird. Um, why was the result of like the hold fast having that really high availability of nitrogen so surprising to you? And is that like normal for kelps or like, can you tell, can you walk me through that? You might've said it. And like, like I said, my internet was like cutting out. So. Well, I don't, I don't know how normal it is for kelps because like, I think as far as I know, I'm the only person that has looked at nutrient differences, like within the same thallus. Um, there's, there, ha there has been a study that proved the actual movement of carbon throughout a bunch of different kelps. One of them was pterygophora, but they didn't, like they took, um, they didn't take like all the nutrient samples. They only looked for the C14 tracer and they had only added it to the, like the blade during the growth season. And so they found that well, and that was carbon, so that's not really, re it's not totally relevant to the your nitrogen question, but I guess it was just like so unexpected to me because I figured that all the blade, the blades would have so much nitrogen because of pigments and that there was, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it just really surprised me. It was unexpected that the, that the hold fast, which everyone, assumes is mostly for attachment is doing more it's it's having some sort of accumulation so I guess that's just maybe it's not really that big of a deal but to me I just wasn't expecting it and I was like that is so cool and weird I have more uh, questions but I'll let someone else do it okay. Good job, Lindsay, Lindsay I'm, I'm gonna see if anyone else go ahead and raise your hands uh if on zoom if you have any questions Lindsay on that one uh, one of the most conspicuous, we're going to have Aunt Amanda ask a question in a second. One of the most conspicuous, conspicuous things I saw in your figures were your wonderful volunteers picking all the crap out of the holdfast. Have you considered that maybe the animals inhabiting the holdfast might be a source of ammonium and therefore nitrogen accumulation? And so it's really literally nothing to do with movement, but just simply that's the cool place where all the animals are peeing. Mm -hmm. And like, I was wondering if maybe, you know, I mean, I know there's lots of like interstitial space in the holdfast, and so there's more, there's more inhabitants down there than on, you know, on the stipe. But I was also wondering, like, you know, are are any of them actually feeding on the stipe if it's full of, of nutrients too? But that's a that's a cool point. We did find. I found mostly, I think, algae in the holdfast, but there was like some tube worm stuff going on and some polychaetes and, um, but yeah, that's a cool point for sure. All right. I think I was gonna go ahead and let um, Amanda unmute and uh, ask you a question. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> Hi, Lindsay. Oh, way cool. I loved that whole, I love your whole project. That was really, really interesting. And um, also my brain was doing sort of like new somersaults and stretching in new ways and thinking about how autotrophs um, kind of respond in terms of their nitrogen and their carbon uh, fractionation. So I'm still thinking to uh, actually, Mike asked the question that I was going to ask about whether you thought maybe the source of the nitrogen um, in the the hold fast was related to the inverts there. But another thing that in animals um, we sometimes say is nitrogen will become nitrogen 15 will become enriched um, during periods of starvation when mm -hmm. there's a lot of like cell recycling or nutrient recycling. I mean, just, what's the sort of residence time of tissue in different regions of pterygophora? Do you think that could be a factor? And is there anything that you could think of from your mm -hmm. data that might speak to that? Honestly, that is a tough question. And it's funny too, because I actually measured, I got 
N15 data with my isotope samples too, but I was struggling with the literature to like find the relevance of that measurement in my seaweed since it's mostly used in food webs and things like that. And, and it was hard for me to com like, people compare that from species to species where I was comparing all of my samples within the same thallus. So I was really struggling to ma make that N15 value values relevant to my study. So I didn't end up including it because it was just too confusing, but yeah, uh, we should, we should talk about this later. Cause that's interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know exactly how to answer your question. <laughs> no, and I'm not even sure my, if my question is going to be relevant for an alga. You know, I mean, in animals, it's it's talking about like urea excretion enriching the tissue and things that may not play out the same way in the physiology of an algal cell. But at mm -hmm. the same time, yeah, um, I think your data might speak really well to looking at things like, you know, what is the residence time of any isotopic signature in different cell types mm -hmm. or, you know, kind of seeing whether different cells have different retention and therefore kind of, yeah, really yeah. looking in the nitty gritty. We'll talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I, I, there's so many more questions I have that I feel like, oh, well, I should have just done that, but I had no idea how any of this would turn out. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Amanda. All right, we've got one more question from Melissa Neemans. It looks like she can't turn her hands on, so I'm Melissa, go ahead and unmute yourself, though, and, and come in and, and ask the question. Can you hear me? I was having a little struggle. <laughs> yeah. Great job, Lindsay. I'm so excited to see you. Thank Sorry, I can't turn my camera on. I'm in uniform for work, and we're not allowed to have our uh, public faces and everything included. So um, I'm smiling very big for you, very excited. Um, so my question is, and pardon my complete ignorance, I'm gonna pretend I know anything, Mike, about algae, so I apologize. <laughs> um, so given that you mentioned earlier the latitudinal difference in vegetative blade loss, is that, is, would you expect to see that difference because of sort of ambient nutrient availability? So like how much more productive the waters are in the Monterey Bay area versus um, Southern California? Or is that temperature or light? Or is there a difference in like health and resilience based on ocean conditions in those different areas? So, okay. I, this, there's a study I'm thinking of where they talked about, um, the cleaving of a blade on a di on a different species. There's not there's not too many things I was was able to reference for my species, but um, there has been a lot of like photo period stuff done on Terragophora in the higher latitudes, and they see like definitive um seasonality in pterogophora so i do think that that is a big factor and it could also be maybe like disturbance level too so when the blade gets to a certain size it just can't hold up to like uh, wave stress and i don't know if in those areas there could be more wave stress but i do think that photo period is a big factor in the higher latitudes for sure for sure you so photo period meaning that they are way to explain that more <laughs> very complicated they like they in the the studies that i'm thinking of they alter they look at altered rhythms and oh, okay okay yeah so it's it's partially beyond my expertise, but um, they have, there's much starker periods of light and dark in the higher latitudes. So that really has an effect on like the rings, like I showed you and the seasonal growth patterns. Okay. So just much more impacted because of that variability in seasons. Mm -hmm. I think my results, if I had done that second question analysis in the other latitudes, I probably would have had some different results. 
And you think that's mostly, so that's mostly based on then light availability and not necessarily like the, the conditions that they're in, maybe other than um, the intensity of wave exposure or something like that. Yeah, because well, a lot of the studies that have been done on seasonality show that at one in Terragoffer in particular that their blade growth is not dependent on the ambient nutrient uh, nutrient availability in the water. So I think that that might well, would probably have a smaller effect on the on the seasonal blade growth than than the irradiance would. Thank you. All right, so I got one more question. This one's from Stefan Bitterwolf, but I'm <laughs> I'm not really secure in opening the mic to Stefan and letting him speak freely. So he has typed in his question. Um, Lindsay, is it possible that Terry has special proteins in its holdfast that'll help it to attach to the rocks? Could this increased nitrogen you saw in the holdfast be a result of these proteins? Yeah, I really want to do protein analysis on the Holdfest. And even Jason and I were talking about how are the cells or are the medulla, medullary tissue in the Holdfest even different than the other regions? I don't, I didn't pay very close attention when I cut the Holdfest pieces, but I don't recall seeing like very much ring definition. So it'd be cool to look into that and I do think that something protein wise or or related to that is happening differently in the hold fast so I would be very interested in doing like that particular analysis on the hold fast all right I'm about ready to give us up to the committee I, I have one more little quick one um you didn't talk much about mortalities right um but you did show that you had a very significant drop in carbon um, when you removed all the biomass, basically all the blades. So the question is, they seem to survive, but given the drop you saw, how many years do you think they could go with no biomass? Basically, how long are those reserves good for? How many more years could they have taken that much of a drop before they completely crapped out? I don't know an exact amount of time. I would, I to, I would have definitely loved to just keep cutting and keep cutting and monitoring those ones to see if they just completely died off. But I did, I did struggle towards the end of the experiment to uh, collect individuals from that group. I was finding less and less of those tagged individuals underwater, and I don't know if that was because they lost their tags because I found a few chewed pieces down there or if maybe they, you know, dislodged themselves. But it was really interesting because I would, so after I harvested every three months, I would do all the morphometric measurements again before I cut the samples. And the the treatment where all blades were cut off, they were still regrowing spor uh, sporophylls and their sporophylls were developing sori, but the sporophylls that were regrowing in the uh, minus sporophyll treatment, none of them regrew sori like the, other, like the all blades cut off ones did. So it seems like maybe they were preparing like last ditch effort, produce spores, like, uh, get more individuals growing in the population because we feel like bad things are happening and we're going to die soon. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how long they would hang on, but it would be cool to see how long that 